We're doing this for my friend Kate. Who drew this? Grab your jacket. Let's go. Kate, I really hope you like this because this is insanely cold. Today, I'm going to take a sketch that was done on site and turn it into a studio painting. Enjoy. So I'm back in the warmth of my truck. I've got four little sketches plus tons and tons of photos. I think I've got a couple ideas that you'll like. So you have this big giant foreground tree in shadow and there is all kinds of color bouncing around in here. And it's not totally dark. It's why I kind of just hatched in some of this, this dark uh, Sharpie value. You have casting all these shadows onto the ground. So the light's coming from behind, raking in. And then you have another tree trunk over here. And it is, you know, up close to these things. These tree trunks are massive. And feels like a conversation between these two. And then up in, up in the actual foliage, it is just bright, bright color. But it's in shadow. So it's, you know, it's kind of fascinating to figure out how to get that to look like it's in shadow, but still have that bright color. And I, I like the idea also of a few more little trees back here. And you have a street going through here. What you are seeing now is the end of the block in process. I'm doing my best to get a close approximation of the value and color of what things should be. It's not going to be exact. Close is good at this point. Then I'm going to take a knockdown knife and mess things up, dragging color across edges. It serves two purposes. It creates interest and it lets you go forward without treating the things that you've already done as if they're finished. After that, we draw again. At this stage, we're going to be putting in secondary shapes, which create form in the objects of your landscape. You do that by showing different planes of those initial shapes. You need to decide what is going to become three-dimensional and what will stay flat and graphic. Typically, what is closer will have form, and as things recede, they will appear flatter. Here I am showing one side of the foreground tree being warmer and the other side being relatively cooler. There was a body of water to the right side of the scene, which brought in a lot of cool light from the sky. I exaggerated it because I thought it was interesting and it gave the tree a little more form. Push things further than you're comfortable with. You can always pull them back later. If you are enjoying the video, please give it a like, subscribe, or leave a comment. It helps the channel a great deal and I appreciate it. Thank you for watching and let's get back to the painting. Here I'm adding in darker notes to the foreground trees and grass. That will add more contrast and bring those both forward. You can see on the ground plane, the edges of the shadows are lighter than the body of the shadows. Leaf masses of the trees which are casting those shadows onto the ground are not as solid as say a house or a car. Envision it in your head for a second. You're looking up at a tree. There's a lot of variation in the edge of the leaves as they are stacked densely in some places and more sparsely in others, which creates an uneven shadow edge. This will change depending on what type of tree it is and also the season. Keep that in mind when you're trying to paint something like this. Up close, you can see it with relative ease in most cases. As the tree shadows get further back, you won't notice it as much. When putting in secondary shapes, you can paint in two different ways. Sometimes you paint positively and other times negatively. Sometimes you are creating smaller shapes. That's painting positively. Other times you are carving back the boundary of a shape. That's negative painting. As you get further into a painting, you will be doing both at the same time, which can be a tricky thing. One way to think about it is this way. Are you painting inside the silhouette of a larger shape, or are you curving back or expanding that silhouette? You will hear artists say, you need to move around the canvas as you paint. That can be a good idea to follow, but you need to be aware of the nuances of it. Sometimes artists will make a few marks in an area, move somewhere else, make a few marks, and continue doing that across the whole painting until they are done. Other times they will work in an area and build out the secondary shapes until there is a general understanding of what is happening. Then they will move on to another large shape to do the same. They will cycle through everything multiple times until they finish. For me, in the way I paint, I will do both or a mixture depending on the painting. 
If it's a small piece, making a few marks and moving on to the next area is more intuitive because I can make sense of the whole painting at once. If it's a large painting like this one, that becomes more difficult for me. I don't think it is a one-size-fits-all situation type thing. They are both variations on the idea of moving around the canvas, and you have to think what would make the most sense in the painting you're doing right now. Contrast that to rendering out an object to finish before moving on to the next object beside it. I will occasionally paint this way, but it fights against my nature, and it doesn't particularly work well for me. Whichever method you choose, your ability to problem solve in that method will grow. I think of it as a skill tree. Once you understand the fundamentals, pick and choose ideas that will help you make art depending on your temperament and don't fight yourself. There is a unique way of working for you, but you will have to pull on the threads of different methods to see which one doesn't unravel your confidence moving forward with a painting. Initially, it will be tough regardless, but if you can persevere, you'll figure it out. You can see that it is finally starting to take shape. All the like large shapes are in place, the secondary shapes are in place. I'm starting to get those little bitty pockets of uh, light that are sparkling against the uh, background and from this point forward it'll be a matter of refining back and forth and making the shapes more interesting. Taking like say this shape right here and trying to figure out how to make that shape as interesting as possible and then moving on to the next shape and going back and forth throughout this entire painting and refining it and I usually don't do things like that for a smaller painting because you're trying to capture like this quick gestural quality and you're trying to get those shapes as interesting as possible when you lay them down. But with a painting this large, it's a 24 by 36, so two foot by three foot. That's big enough where I, I have a hard time telling exactly the um, value relationships and how those are going to work from one part of the painting to the other. I do step back the entire time I'm painting, but I can only get back so far in the studio, maybe 10 foot. You know, if you can get back 20 foot, 20 foot would be nice. If you get back 20 foot, you might be able to make the shapes interesting as possible on that first pass. It's really hard to take in this entire painting in this studio. Wherever you are and whatever kind of setup you have, think how far back am I looking at this painting from? Am I seeing the whole picture at once? Or am I looking at parts? And if you're looking at parts, don't confuse how good one part of the painting is with the whole painting. If one part of the painting starts to really get nice and the rest of it is not in harmony with that one part, you've got a problem. Choose, am I going to pay attention to the whole scene or am I going to pay attention to like this one little part? And you know, some paintings may call for that. Some paintings may call for like one little area being hyper focused on and done really well and the rest of it can just be wild and crazy. And if you paint that way, Great. But if you don't, you need to look at the whole scene and try to make it make sense at the same time. Hope that helps. Here I'm working on the foreground. I'm going to put a little bit of bounce light down in that bottom right hand corner. It'll help emphasize that right hand side of the tree with the cool light hitting it. Okay, so you have your foreground tree. So you see these lines. That is going to be a guide map to overlap in these leaf groupings so it looks like there is depth up in the tree. And then I will slowly work my way back. Here I'm putting a slightly darker tone on the edge of the shapes up in the leaves to indicate where the overlap is. On the ground plane, I'm introducing some cooler marks to show the grass picking up the cool tones from the sky. Sometimes a subtle shift in a color's temperature can create a bit of interest as long as you don't push it too far. The foreground tree is done just adding textures and uh, having a good time. The thing I was thinking about with this uh, painting is these two trees are in this eternal embrace and uh, in the fall, it almost becomes like a love story. 
And I, I like the idea that, you know, during the winter, it might seem cold and distant. During the summer, it might seem kind of aloof just because of the atmosphere and you have all these cool blues. But during the fall, you know, it kind of has this like, this tinge of a love story of some kind. So I like, I like this. I'm working a little more contrast into that mid-ground, being sure not to compete heavily with the foreground tree. Then it is back up front, where I push the idea of warm and cool into the tree even further. That tree was so old and weathered, it had those giant chunks of bark that are fun to paint. Like I said earlier, I'm going to move around the canvas. It becomes easier as you go. Once things start to harmonize, a single mark can really stand out. If everything is in discord, it would be hard for that same mark to make a difference. These trees are in the neighborhood Kate lived in, and she wanted to take them with her when she went out into the world. Those little cars and house are to ground the trees into the neighborhood instead of just being two trees randomly in a field. Also, I enjoy painting that kind of stuff. One of the things that I found amazing about this scene was the beautiful light shining through those leaves at the edge of the tree canopy. It reminds me of stained glass windows. There is something truly mesmerizing to walk through that light. It turns everything beneath it beautiful. If you can hold off putting on highlights and accents until all your secondary shapes are finished, satisfaction is about the only way to describe the feeling you will get when you finally do lay them down. It is like getting home after being away for a long time. Now, if you want to paint landscapes in the studio, it helps tremendously to be able to paint them outside. I have a strategy to help you with that right here. See you next time.